Hello, you're watching a lesson on configuring cloud resources. In this lesson, I'm going to pull up the lab design so that you kind of get the shopping mall. Where are we at in this lesson? Uh, we'll be targeting four areas. I've denoted three with arrows and I drew a red box around the bottom area for the resource cluster. So we'll start at the top uh, with the vCloud director cell. We're going to be doing some configuration and installing some tools on the, the server that we had built in a previous lesson. We'll also be deploying the VCNS manager, which was formerly known as the vShield manager. And we'll be connecting the VCNS and also doing some configuration of vCloud to our vCenter cloud. Uh, so that's the vCenter server that's actually managing the cloud environment. And then in the vSphere resource cluster on the bottom that I drew the red box around, we'll be building the provider data center information. So that's the provider virtual data center uh, relationship to the physical hardware. So we're kind of laying down that first platform of virtual infrastructure. So let's dig right in. To begin with, I'm going to cover some pre-configuration tasks that we'll need to do in order to get the vCloud director environment up and running and usable uh, for building out the private cloud. The first item on the task list is installing VMware tools on the vCloud director cell. And this is not really a requirement so much as it is a good practice. Really, any virtual machine should have VMware tools installed upon it. This isn't a virtual appliance. This is the actual vCloud director server that we installed on Red Hat Linux. And because of that, it's not using any kind of third-party VMware tools. We'll need to provide that ourselves. So we'll get that knocked out. We'll also deploy the vCNS manager, which will show up as the vShield manager, but it's the vCloud network and security manager. This is going to be required uh, as a tie-in when we go to complete the vCloud director initial setup. And then we're going to make a relationship between vCenter and vCNS so that the vCloud network and security manager understands that it is being used by and used for the cloud vCenter. So let's get started by installing VMware tools on the vCloud director cell. I'm going to go over the steps to do that, and then we'll perform it in the lab. So the first step that we'll want to do, it's pretty, pretty obvious, right? We're going to install VMware tools, and we've got to kick off the actual tools install wizard. If you've done this in a Windows environment, it's, it's similar in, in the initial kickoff uh, for a Linux environment. You just go in and tell it, hey, I want to start installing tools. And it's going to say, thumbs up, let's do it. The next thing, this is where it starts to get, you know, I'm a Windows guy, so this is where it gets a little confusing uh, if you're not a Linux person, is we're going to run some line commands and we're going to have to make a directory for the CD-ROM and then mount the CD-ROM to that directory. Um, it's not just going to pop up, you know, like in Windows and say, hey, I've got a CD-ROM in here. Do you want to install some software or automatically do it? We're going to have to do a little bit of work to, to get that CD inserted. Then we're going to basically unpack or unzip the file that's contained on the CD-ROM. And uh, kudos to the people that can remember the tar xzf uh, vf command, because I always have to look that up. So that's a, a personal uh, mark of uh, ignorance there, that I can never seem to remember those four letters. Uh, so I don't expect you to, but we're basically telling it to unpack uh, that, that, that VMware Tools version build tar gz file. It basically has a bunch of stuff inside of it that we're going to need. Within that tar.gz file is a VMware install script. And the cool thing is, if we run that command with a dash D at the end, it basically tells the script, use all the default answers. Because I tell you, if you run this thing without the dash D, look out, you're going to have to answer like 50 questions. Uh, and most of them are, uh, I guess you really don't care. Like I, I noticed that I typically don't care what the answers are. I just go default, default, default. So if you hit dash D at the end of the command, it'll just answer all the questions for you. And then we'll want to do a little housekeeping and unmount the CD-ROM so it's not just stuck in the, the virtual machine. And I put a red flag because uh, I, I encounter people a lot of times saying, the unmount command doesn't work. And I say, oh, there's no N in unmount. It's U-mount. And then they kind of look at me like, oh, that's mean. Because <laughs> it is kind of mean. The unmount is just U-mount. But I guess someone wanted to save one letter of the command. So it's U-mount to get rid of the CD-ROM. So let's switch into the lab, and I'll open up the console of the vCloud director server, and we'll do these steps. OK, so I have the vCloud director server up. This is the vSphere client into the home lab. And this was the server that was built in a previous lesson. So all I've done is taken the previous lesson where we installed vCloud director, stopped, and now we're going to do just one additional step 
with the VMware tools. And you'll notice here it's got that red exclamation saying, no tools are running, and that's really not something you want to see. So let's take care of that. I'm going to open the console of the virtual machine, and we'll get that nice and centered for you. I'm not logged in, so let me log in as root with my incredibly secure password. Uh, okay, so we'll start off the install first. Now I've just uh, hit alt, uh, control alt to get my mouse back, go to VM, guest, install tools. And it's going to basically say, hey, this will make your VM awesome. And you make sure your virtual machine is running. So our VM is running, and we want to make it awesome. So I'm going to click OK. And you'll see down there, it says it's, in, it's initiated the VMware tools. Let's drag that over. Installer mount. So that, that's fine. Let me open the console back up. Uh, and you're wondering, OK, if you know, like I said, I'm, I'm more of a Windows guy, and, and there's no pop-up. There's no anything. So we have to run these commands in order to get the actual uh, tools installed. So the first one is we're going to make a directory called mount slash CD-ROM, M-N-T, we pronounce that as mount. And there we go. If it's already made for some reason, maybe your template already comes with it or someone else built the server, you try to run it, you'll just get an error saying that it's already existing. So that just means someone's already made that directory. Then we're gonna change to the mount directory, CD-ROM, so CD is change. And if I hit PWD, present working directory, it'll tell me that I'm in slash mount slash CD-ROM. So we know we're in the right directory. Next, I'm going to actually mount the CD-ROM to this folder. So let me run mount slash dev slash CD-ROM space slash mount CD-ROM. Just saying I want to mount the CD-ROM device to the mount CD-ROM folder. And there we go. It's telling me it's doing it read-only because this is an ISO file. It's a CD-ROM. And, you know, we all know you can't write to a, you know, write-protected CD-ROM, so it's just giving you the warning. Now, if I do a directory lookup of where I'm at, we'll see, oop, let me go to mount CD-ROM. There we go. Uh, we'll see that we've got the VMware tools 9.0.1-9135780.tar.jz. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the version is as long as it's the latest, you know, whatever it is you have in your vSphere environment. Uh, and that's basically version 9 build 9.1.3.5.7.8. So that's cool. Uh, we now see the file. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move to my prep folder because I don't want to actually put stuff into this folder. So I'm going to go to the prep folder that was made in an earlier lesson, CD prep. And if you'll recall, this is where I kind of had my stuff for VMware vCloud. Got my certificates file, my libx DMCP file for vCloud director, and the actual installation. So this is where I'm kind of keeping my stuff. This is where I want to put the extracted VMware tools files. So now I'm going to extract the files by hitting or typing tar xzvf, it's dash xzvf, and then mount slash cd-rom slash, I'm just going to type vm where and hit tab, and it'll automatically complete the file name because it starts with VMware, and hit uh, enter. And it's going to see, you're going to see all this stuff flash by the screen. There's all this stuff that it's unzipping out of that file. There's no errors, looks good, so that's, that's okay. If I do another look in here, now we've got a VMware-Tools-Distrib folder. So cool, looks good. We'll go into that folder, change directory, VMware-Tools tab, it'll complete it. And I'm not gonna do a look in this directory because there's a ton of stuff in here, but we wanna run period forward slash VMware-install.pl uh, and then dash D for the defaults. This is basically saying, I wanna run this script, dot slashes, I wanna run this script with the defaults. So run that, and these are all the questions that are kind of flashing by your screen that you would have had to answer, and it just answered all the questions for you. You didn't have to do any of that stuff. Very handy. There we go. More questions. It's answering. It just keeps answering all these questions. Okay, the VMware tools are installed, and there's a little fun little message from the VMware team saying, you know, it's done, have a nice day. And they're actually kind enough to go ahead and eject the CD-ROM, which is nice. So let's go ahead and unmount the CD-ROM, just make sure it's unmounted. We'll type U-mount, space mount CD-ROM. And it's not mounted, so we verified that it was ejected, which is good, what we want. And now I'm gonna reboot the server. Type reboot, and it's gonna reboot immediately. So make sure this isn't in production when you do that. All right, let's get back to the pre-install configuration checklist. 
So the next thing we want to do is install the VCNS manager, formerly the VShield manager. So I'm going to switch back to the lab and we'll deploy the vApp. Okay, so I'm back in the lab and here's the vCloud director folder. Again, all we, all we have is that uh, cloud vCenter and the vCloud director virtual machine. So we need to add a third virtual machine uh, or a vApp in, in, in more correct terms to our little uh, management cluster. So in an earlier lesson, I went ahead and downloaded the OVA file for the vCNS. If you don't have it, uh, go back to your uh, evaluation of vCloud Director on the VMware website and just go and log in with your evaluation email and download the OVA or just go back to the previous lesson that shows you exactly how to do that. So let's grab it and deploy it to the environment. Let's go to File, Deploy OVF Template, and let's browse. I put it on the desktop, so it's right here. Again, VCNS is not uh, shown anywhere here. It just says vShield Manager, so you just got to remember that. Next, and we'll answer a few questions. So we'll see that it's vShield Manager version 5.1.2. That's fine. It's it's now verified that the publisher is really VMware, so that check mark is good. And here you get kind of the same when we went over the uh, the vCloud Director Appliance, and I talked about thin and thick provisioning. It's similar here. If you use thin provisioning, which is where we only write the actual used blocks to disk, it's about 1.8 gig. But if you thick provision, which means you're reserving all the possible space this virtual machine might ever use, it's 60 gig. I'm going to use thin provision uh, because I'm on NFS and because it's a lab. And even for a production environment, there's really nothing wrong with using thin provisioning. It's really more up to, you have to talk to your storage guy and see if you're thin provisioning on the array or not. If you're usually if you're thin provision on the array, you would thick provision on the virtual machine. So those are kind of questions you'll want to go over. But again, thin is usually fine. I'm clicking next and then uh, read the agreement and and speed read it, kind of like the micro machines guy with his talking, and make sure that you accept all these uh, licenses, all these license requirements. So I'm going to go ahead and accept and hit next, and then. Again, vShield Manager, I'm fine with that. I don't have any other in my environment. But make sure the name is something meaningful to you and your team. And I'm going to throw it because I have vCloud Director selected when I ran the wizard. It's automatically going to put it in the vCloud Director folder. So next, I'm going to put it in my lab uh, cluster, which is, in this case, it's my management cluster. And hit Next. I'm not going to use a resource pool. We don't need one. Uh, just the, the root lab is fine. And then I'm going to put it on my virtual machines data store. It's where I put all my VMs. Click next. There we go. Again, this may be highlighted or, or grayed out for you. Because I'm on NFS, thin provision is the only option uh, because NFS does not support thick provisioning without a vendor plugin. Uh, but you, if you need thick provision, lazy zeroed or eager zeroed. And basically, the difference is lazy zero doesn't actually write the zeros, but it does allocate all that space. So you'd either way, 60 gigs would be allocated. The difference is the lazy zero is just provisioning it, but not actually writing the zeros. Eager zero is going to provision 60 gigs and then write all the zeros in for the other 58 gig that aren't being used. So again, we'll use thin provision and make sure you got enough space up here. So I'm good. Uh, and then a network mapping, I'm going to throw it on my virtual machines port group. You'd want to put it on whatever port group is necessary to talk back uh, to your vCloud uh, uh, vCenter. So we'll click next there. Just a little, you know, screen showing you exactly what you what you've chosen in the previous screen. So that looks fine. Uh, again, I don't ever like to power on after deployment. It's just a habit I've gotten into. I always like to make sure that it looks, you know, I like to give it a once over. I'm gonna click finish here and let it deploy. Uh, I like to give it a once over and just see exactly how it deployed before I powered on. So just, uh, I guess, uh, a cautiousness in myself. So I'll be back when this gets done to deploying. Okay, the deployment completed successfully. The vShield Manager is now in the environment. I'm gonna close the little box here and click on it. And again, I just like to eyeball it. Make sure it doesn't have any weird requirements. See, th this is what I'm talking about. Eight gigs of memory in the lab, that's very overkill for me. I don't need eight gigabytes of memory dedicated to a virtual machine or a vShield Manager virtual machine that's going to manage maybe eight VMs total. It's just a waste of my lab resources. So I'm going to actually edit this and drop down exactly what it's using for the lab. Now, in a production environment, 8 gig probably isn't a big deal, but when you're running a host that only has 16 gig, this is half a host for my lab environment. So I'm gonna knock that down to about 2 gig. 
just to save me some some space here. The two CPUs I'm fine with. Um, so that all looks good. Click OK. And now I'm going to power it on. And your lab will be different. You know, if you've got a lab where the servers have 48 gigs of memory or hundreds of gigs of memory, 8 gig, who cares? But for me, it's a lot. So I'm going to power that on. And we'll let it kind of go through its thing. I'm going to click the, the console here on the vShield manager. And it's going to run through kind of some initial setup and power on. And that's perfectly fine. You see it's running some scripts. So just let it do its thing. OK, now that the vShield manager or vCNS manager is fired up, let's log in. I'm just going to enter to clear off some of the stuff on the screen here. The default login is admin. And the password is the, the word default in lowercase. So you log in. There we go. And you see the warning system startup is not yet complete. Please log off and log back on in a few minutes. It's just letting you know that it hasn't quite finished what it's trying to do. Uh, so if you could log off, it'd appreciate it. So we're, we're gonna exit out and give it a little more time. But I just wanted to show you what that warning would look like. So I'll be back after this is kind of warmed up. All right, I'm back and I checked really quick to make sure that it's ready to go. That's why there's an extra login in there. So it is, so admin, default, it's all lowercase. Default is like this, by the way, D-E-F-A-U-L-T, all lowercase. Uh, so there we go. And it kind of looks like a switch, if you'll notice. There's a, you know, it just has a manager and a little kind of greater than sign. And it's not very helpful. Like, what do I do? So let's go over exactly what you do to set this thing up uh, so that we can complete the, the deployment of this uh, device. So the first thing I want to do is type the word enable. And this is going to enable kind of more authoritative access to the vShield manager. And it's going to ask for a password. It's the same thing. Type default lowercase. And there we go. Now it's a manager with a pound sign. And this means you're, that you're in a privileged mode. So we can run the setup command. Just type setup. And it's going to ask you just a few questions. And then you'll be good to go on this thing. So let me put in the IP. My IP that I'm going to use is 10.0.0.86. The mask is a class C. It's 3255s.0. The gateway is 10.0.0.200. The DNS is 10.0.0.4. And again, these will change depending on what you have. I don't have a secondary DNS. And search list is glacier.local. It'll be your domain name, basically. Do I want to save the configuration? Yes. And then it says very, very politely, please log out and log back in. It's always nice. So we'll exit. Log back in, admin, default. Nope, got to wait a little bit longer. So you're going to hit a few of those. So that's fine. I'll exit out. We'll come back when that's ready to go. OK, I've been logging in and off a few times to make sure it's ready. And it looks like it is. So we'll log in again. Admin, default. There's no warning or anything like that. It looks good. Now what we're going to do now is just a quick ping test to make sure that everything's good to go. So ping. I'm going to ping the gateway. It's 10, 0, 0, 200. And we're getting pings back, so we know it's good to go. So at this point, I'm done with the command line interface. I can get out of. Uh, I just hit Control-C to cancel the ping. Um, so we can get out of this and move into the GUI. All right, so I brought up Internet Explorer. And let's connect to the vShield Manager. So type in the HTTPS for secure. And the URL, and I've cheated. I've already been there before. That's why it's auto-filling here. Except the warning, because you're always going to get one, because the certs aren't signed, unless you install the cert on your computer, which I typically don't do. We'll log in as admin. Password is default. Check the little lock in, login button there. OK, so here's the initial config. And I hope you like this page, because it's pretty much all you're going to see of the vShield Manager because we're really not doing anything else inside of this thing other than configuring this kind of screen here. And that's because all the rest of vShield's work will be done and initiated through vCloud Director. So vShield kind of becomes just kind of an extension of vCloud. It's kind of a, a worker VM or service VM. So let's begin by configuring the lookup service, which is something new to uh, vCenter 5.1. And click Edit. The Edit buttons, they're a little bit hidden here, but Edit uh, Lookup Service, we'll type in the information. So first, I'll check the box turning it on, because it is optional, uh, depending on your version. So we'll go ahead and put in the service host. That's In my case, that's the vCenter server for cloud. 
uh, for my cloud environment. You could potentially have it on different servers. So vcenter-cloud.glacier.local. Keep the port the way it is. I'll put in my SSO administrator username. So that's admin at system dash domain. Password is super secret, so you can't see it. And there we go. And it'll let you know that the certificate is not, you know, trusted. So you have to click yes to accept it. And you'll see that all over the place. So just keep hitting yes, um, especially in a lab environment. Who cares? You might be using more legitimate certificates in a production environment, you know, like uh, signed by VeriSign or something like that. Uh, or even your own internal certificate authority could be signing it. Okay, so because that went through without an error, we know it's good to go. Otherwise, it would pop up and yell at you and, you know, kind of hit you over the head with a frying pan saying to fix it. Uh, the next step is connecting now to the vCenter server. So the lookup service and vCenter server are in 5.1. They're two different objects, two different entities. So I'll we'll click edit on vCenter server, and it's the same deal. Typing in vCenter-cloud.glacier.local. And I'm going to use my administrator, which is a, an account called root. Um, you would probably want to create a service account, maybe call it vShield um, or vCNS. And that way it's an account that only the vShield account would be using or the vShield uh, manager would be using. So mine's root and my cool password there. I don't know if I typed it right. I'll try it again. And by default, we're going to assign that account to be a vShield enterprise administrator. So there's actually different user levels within uh, vShield. And enterprise admin is basically the highest level of authority you can give something within the vShield manager. So we'll leave that checked to, to do that. And we're not doing any of these uh, script plugin things like that. That's uh, you can ignore that. Click OK. And again, uh, it's pretty much if the screen goes away and it looks good, it was uh, successful. We'll accept the certificate there. I wasn't kidding. You're going to click yes on those certificates a thousand times. So get used to it. And then once the please wait thingy goes away, we're uh, we're all squared away. There's only one other thing to really configure, and that's the time server. There we go, and it kind of refreshes the screen, and you might think, oh, what happened? It's just letting you know that it actually pulled inventory and is successful. So that's what you want to see, last successful inventory, and then the date that's being pulled. So that looks good. Uh, DNS was already configured when we did the command line, so you don't have to touch anything there unless you needed to change it. And then NTP, we'll go ahead and give it a time server, and in my case, the... DNS and time server, the same thing. Okay. And it tells you you need to reboot after changing that. So we'll reboot. I'll reboot out of out of sync with the lesson here. You don't need to watch me reboot it. But just when you get done, make sure to, to reboot the, uh, the vShield manager. Uh, and then if you have a syslog server, you can enter the information here. I don't have one. It's not necessary for the install, but that's basically uh, where you'd put that in. And I'll show you real quick. We'll go to users, and you'll see here what I was talking about with the enterprise admin. We now have um, this root account on vCenter as an enterprise administrator. So it's a, it's a global admin. It can manage anything that this vShield manager has access to. So that's what I was talking about when you check the box, allowing it to be an enterprise administrator. OK, so let's get back into the lesson, and we'll continue along. All right, so the last thing we need to do in this lesson is the initial setup of vCloud Director. And that basically means that we're going to point our web browser to it and kick off a few tasks in order to get this thing ready for future lessons. So I'll say the first thing you need to do is make sure you have your key handy. You'll need your license key that you got as part of the evaluation. So have that just pocketed somewhere nearby. And your choices for browsers for vCloud Director is Firefox or Internet Explorer. Now, I'm a big uh, Google Chrome user. So this has always kind of stuck me in the craw and that I've got to switch over browsers uh, and, and for most of the lessons, I'll pretty much always stay on Internet Explorer, so it's not going to be a problem. But uh, if you're on Chrome or an older version of Firefox, you'll have to make the switch uh, just because there are some incompatibilities and a nag screen will come up every time you log into the web page. Can you, can you just tell the sarcasm there? It's very annoying. <laughs> uh, basically telling you you need to choose one of these two browsers. So make sure you use a supported browser uh, regardless of what your choice is. So the two actions that we'll be focusing on to tie up this lesson is we're going to attach a vCenter to vCloud so that we've got a relationship between the vCloud director server and a vCenter server that we're using for our cloud environment. And what this really does is it exposes the resources that that vCenter has, such as its hosts and storage, so that we can use those to build the second task, which is create a provider VDC. 
without having a vCenter server exposed to vCloud Director and, and a relationship built between the two, we're unable to do anything within vCloud Director. It just kind of sits there saying, I, I don't have any resources. I'm kind of worthless. So we'll kick those two off. And then the future lessons will build upon that because we'll have the resources from the lab that we can give out to our tenants or an internal organization. We can build networks and, and all that fun stuff. So let's switch back into the lab and kick off the two quick start actions that are necessary to get vCloud Director ready to rock. Okay, so from a just blank web browser, I'm going to type in, uh, let's see here, there we go, got my browser back, the secure HTTPS to the vcd.glacier.local, and again, I uh, have already been there, and that's why it's autofilling uh, from an earlier lesson. So we'll click that, again, certificate, continue, trust the cert, and uh, there's no nag screen or anything because I'm on Internet Explorer, but this is a unique setup screen that you're only going to see one time. Once you configure this, you can never go back to it. So it's a good time to make sure you really have in mind exactly the answers you want to use. Although I will say a lot of this you can change after the fact, but you won't be able to get back to this screen unless you wipe your cell, uh, vCloud Director cell, and start over again. So let's go ahead and walk through it and get the cell configured for our VMware vCloud lab. So first things first, you have to agree to the license agreement. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the license joke. I'll just scroll through it really quick here and accept the license. You know, hopefully you've read all of that and committed it to memory. Uh, so next on that, now you need your license key. So this is the key. If you don't remember where it's at, it's on your uh, evaluation page on VMware. So that's where you go to VMware.com and, and you go, to, you know, you log in to the vCloud Director evaluation and pull your key up. It should also be in your email. It was covered in a previous lesson. So we'll grab that and paste it in. Okay, so I've pasted in my key, and it'll be different for you, and the expiration will be different for you. Mine expires April 10th. Uh, yours will probably expire whatever you're, whenever you kicked off the evaluation, 60 days after that. So we'll click Next out of that. And then we need to provide some administrator account details. It's basically, this is going to be the highest level authority, kind of root user, so to speak, for vCloud Director. And I want you to pay special attention to the fact that it's called administrator. It's not admin, it's not root. I don't really think there's many products that VMware has that uses the full word administrator. So that can throw people off where you'll try to log in later with admin and wonder, did I mess the password up or what's the problem? You need to use administrator. You know, in the future, you'll be able to tie, you know, something like Active Directory or, or other accounts to this. You don't have to use administrator, but for the initial piece, you just have to remember that. So I'm going to put in a password. It needs to be six characters or longer with special characters and numbers and, you know, alien graffiti and things like that in there. So I'm going to use my typical password that gets past that. Um, just make sure it's somewhat strong for a production environment and in your password safe and who cares in a lab. Uh, and then I'll put my contact details. So Chris Wall and uh, I'll use a, a fake email address, fake at fake.com. Uh, don't try to email that. It's not me. Uh, so there we go. So moving on, the next step is system settings. And if you, you read it here, it says the system name will be used to create a folder for the vCloud Director cluster. So that means all the vCloud Director cells will, will kind of go fall under this naming that you build here. So you don't need to call this vcd1 and the next one vcd2, et cetera. This is for the cluster itself. So make it a name that represents the cluster of vCloud Directors that you're going to put together for this environment. Now, in this, in this particular lesson and in this series of lessons, we're just setting up one vCloud Director server. So you have one server, one cluster, in one data center. It makes it super easy. You don't really need to think about scale that much in the lab. But in, in real life, you know, when you're actually doing deployments on these things, these are important considerations to go over because you may have two private clouds in the same data center. Uh, they may be managed by different entities. You know, you may have a private cloud for your corporate IT and then you acquire another company or maybe there's a, a test dev IT department that's also going to build a vCloud. So you need to be very considerate of having multiple vCloud environments in here uh, as far as the name and the ID. So what I'm going to call this is just the Chicago, Chicago Cloud. That's the name of my cluster here. You know, it just represents the fact that I'm in Chicago and I'm building a cloud, nothing fancy. Maybe if you're going to build two, you might put a one at the end. The second cloud would be called two, something like that. 
Now, installation ID, again, does a pretty good job at telling you within the warning. It just means that there's a pool of MAC addresses already predefined for each ID number. Um, so if you put ID 1, it's going to draw from a very specific set of MAC addresses for the virtual machines. Because you don't, you don't allocate the virtual machine MAC addresses yourself, it does it. Uh, if you had two vCloud director environments in the same data center and you use the same installation ID, you could have MAC address conflicts where two virtual machines are trying to claim the same MAC address, and that's bad. So basically, the way it works is each vCloud director cluster needs to use a different installation ID. So if for some reason you had two of them in the same layer two domain, which is typically your data center, you'd want to have installation ID one and then installation ID two. A trick that I like to use is if this is, if I know I'm going to have more, I'll probably go ahead and number this and add a one for this one. Let's say we had, uh, we were building out system two. I'd put two at the end of the, the name. Uh, so it's Chicago Cloud 02 with installation ID number two. And it just makes it easier in my mind to have numbers that match. So anyways, that's how that works. We're just using Chicago Cloud and ID number one. And you can replace the city name with wherever you live. So next, it's just review telling you what you configured. That's all fine, so I'll click Finish. And there we go. It, it very nicely says thank you and boots you right out of the, the little wizard there, a little unceremoniously. So go ahead and log in using your new credentials. And that's administrator, don't forget. And my super secret password that passes the login requirements there. So there we go. Welcome to vCloud Director. You're in, you're done. It's ready to rock. You can actually start building stuff. Well, not really. There's still a little bit more provisioning we have to do. Uh, and remember I mentioned earlier about quick start. So this whole area at the top is the quick start. And it's meant to be kind of a, a helpful way to walk you through provisioning everything you need to do to build your cloud. For this lesson, we're only focused on item number one, which is attach a vCenter, and item number two, which is create a provider VDC. All of the other items will be covered in depth in future lessons, uh, but I don't want to just kind of gloss over them with this one. I want to go really deep with them in the uh, you know upcoming videos. So what we're going to do now is basically the bare minimum requirements to build out the foundation for this vCloud environment so that we can build upon it later. And that just boils down to we need a vCenter because we need resources, and we need a provider VDC because we need to build stuff on top of that. That is the base level of logical resources that everything else uses, the provider VDC. So we'll start with attaching a vCenter server. I'll just click the link, and it's a very simple wizard. Give me the information for vCenter. All right, well, we've typed that in several times already, so that's no big deal. vCenter cloud.glacier.local. Keep the standard 443 port. That's what it uses to communicate. I'm gonna use my root account, but again, you probably want a service account, maybe call it vCloud just so you're not you know, using the God mode password over and over again. So I'll put in my password, vCenter name, and this is what it's gonna show up as in the list. I'll show it to you later, but it doesn't have to be the exact name of the vCenter server. So I could, I could even call this the Chicago vCenter for cloud server. And that's literally what it's gonna show up as in the logical view when I manage resources. So if you don't like how long that is, you could just call it Chicago vCenter whatever you want. Description could be, uh, this server manages vCloud resources in the Chicago data center. I mean, you don't have to write a novel there. It's not war and peace, but it's something a little descriptive can help because, you know, you may not be the only administrator in your team. You know, it's very common to have several uh, folks in the same team. Uh, and then what I like to do is I go ahead and click the, uh, for the vSphere web client URL, I go ahead and say, use the following URL, and I look it up. Uh, I've not had great success with the use vSphere services to provide the URL. In fact, it even puts up a warning saying that uh, it cannot provide the URL. So rather than mess around with that, I like to use uh, this, this method here. And I just cheat. I go to a new browser tab, and I just connect to the vCenter server that's managing my cloud resources. So in this case, it's HTTPSS vCenter-cloud. Click that there. So that's the server. It's going to give you another certificate warning. Continue through that. And right here it says log in to vSphere web client. I can just right click that, say copy shortcut, and then go back here and paste the shortcut. And there we go. I mean, it doesn't get much easier than that. You don't have to remember any of this. I mean, if you do want to remember this, it has a little kind of uh, hint right there and you could fill it in, but I like to be absolutely certain. So I just go ahead and snag it from the uh, URL of 
the server itself. The one thing I, I would like to do though is I don't like having it without the fully qualified domain name. So I'm gonna finish that up with glacier.local. I don't wanna just use the short kind of net BIOS name of the server. So I'll click next. And it didn't give us any warnings. And that's, uh, again, that's the indication that it's working. It won't let you just get to the end uh, because it's gonna check these passwords. So I'll just prove that out real quick. I'll add a, a false character there to my password. And now it's going to warn me that it couldn't connect to the vCenter server. So there we go, fail to connect. So it's kind of built in as you're doing it. That's gonna keep checking the information that you're putting in there to make sure it's legit. That's kind of nice. So now we need to tie into the vShield manager. And this specifically is the vShield manager that the vCenter server is using. Every vCenter server should have a one-to-one -one relationship with one vShield manager. So if you had a large deployment you're doing where it's multiple vCenter servers talking to multiple vShield managers where you have a lot of one-to-one -one relationships, every time you enter this vCenter information, you need to make sure to use the specific vShield manager that that vCenter server is talking to. You don't just pick a random one out of the pool. So I'm gonna type in the IP, which is 10.0.0.86 for the one we just deployed earlier, uh, admin and default. And if you wanted to make another account for this thing to use, uh, you're more than welcome to. It's in that users page that I showed you. I'm just gonna be lazy here and use the admin account uh, because it really isn't a big deal either way. And I'm gonna click next. And it's gonna show me a list of things. Again, it checked to make sure the account is legit. Uh, before it let me get to this page. So I know the password and account that I used is uh, a legitimate account. So it's just a review showing you what you're gonna do. That's fine, I'm gonna click finish. And that one's pretty quick. There's really not much that goes on. And if you'll notice, everything was grayed out down here and, and even some of the stuff was here was grayed out. Now it's all lit up because once you have vCenter, you can really start building because before that you didn't have any resources. So the next thing we wanna do, or really the final thing we wanna do in this lesson is create the provider VDC. And this is a really important step because this is gonna provide all the resources pretty much for everything else. All of your organizations and tenants and departments will use resources out of an organizational VDC and an organizational VDC gets everything from a provider VDC. So we're building, you know, to use that house analogy, kind of vSphere is the ground and the provider VDC is the foundation of the house and everything's built on top of that. So we'll click through this wizard and we'll talk about it as we go. I'll click on the create button. So the first thing is the name and it's interesting how much thought you can put into a name like this. The more traditional way to do it is uh, the name should reflect uh, like a metal. So let's say gold, silver, bronze. And a lot of times what I'll see is um, the compute level and storage level and things like that will relate to kind of the, the rarity of the metal. So we'll say gold may be the best compute, uh, best servers, the best blade servers, maybe the fastest storage, something like that. Or it may be that gold is the most highly resilient. You know, it's the uh, it's got extra switches, it's got extra UPSs, it has an SLA, which is the service level agreement of five nines. Maybe it's backed up real time. It's got, you know, really nice disaster recovery, tape backups, things like that. Either way can kind of define what your metal is going to be for gold, silver, bronze, something like that. Or you can call it tier one, tier two, tier three. Uh, but you need to go into it kind of understanding what you're going to classify things as. If you're going to call it gold, there needs to be kind of an understanding of what gold is, you know, an agreement with you and the business and the organization on if something is gold, it gets X. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and call this gold. This will be our gold tier of resources. And by you know, this particular lab, we're calling it gold because it's all we have and it's gonna be the best of what we have. It's gonna be all the best servers and storage and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gonna really depend. So for our use case, we're gonna call this gold. This is gonna be the best tier of compute storage and network that we can provide. We're not, uh, we don't have any other tiers at this time. Uh, so we'll just go with this being the best. And so in the description, we can say it's the, the best compute layer. Um, it's the, highest storage tiers and uh, continuous uh, backups, something like that. You know, it really depends on your use case. But for us, we're gonna provide the, the gold, this will be the gold standard of compute and resources that we'll provide. Then you've got the choice of, well, first you've got the choice of enabling or disenable, disabling it. And that just means when we build it, will we let people use it right away or not? Other admins that are building on top of it? 
we're the only admin here, so I'm going to leave it enabled. But if you had a big team of admins and you didn't want them touching this and there's kind of an unspoken rule, if it's disabled, don't touch it, you might want to disable it. The last thing is the hardware version, and it gives you a pretty decent uh, detail down here. It's basically, what are we supporting in this environment? And it really boils down to version 7 is meant for vSphere 4.1, uh, version 8 is meant for vSphere 5.0, and version 9 is for vSphere 5.1. So if I had some 4.1 hosts in here somewhere, I would need to make sure that I set this to 7, because that's the highest uh, level of hardware version I could support globally for this provider VDC. I couldn't take a version 9 virtual machine, for example, and throw it onto a 4.1 host. It just doesn't work. Because everything here is ESXi 5.1 or better, I can choose hardware version 9 and be safe with that. So just be aware of what kind of host you're going to have in your cluster and adjust accordingly. So the next is, at first it's kind of weird looking, the, the picture here. We're basically starting here and kind of moving kind of clockwise. So we select a vCenter server first. So this is the vCenter server that we want to attach this provider VDC to. We don't have any resource pools. I'm not using any resource pools. That, if you think about it, is a way that we could take a pile of compute and kind of slice it into smaller piles of compute. So we could take a 10 host cluster, make a resource pool called maybe gold, another one called silver, give gold a bigger piece of the pie and silver a smaller piece of the pie, um, and, and further subdivide. Uh, that's not always the best way to go about. You know, If you have the ability to just provide one cluster to the environment and say that is all this tier, like this is the, the vCloud cluster that I built is all going to be for gold tier, uh, gold provider VDC. To me, that's a little bit cleaner and easier to troubleshoot. Uh, and really, there's some, been some changes that we'll go over on the storage that made a lot of those resource pool tricks not necessary. So what we're doing in this, in this particular lesson is we're just going to give the whole cluster to the gold environment. I've clicked it and now it's all blue. So basically, the gold provider VDC will attach to the Chicago vCenter, uh, which is that vCenter-cloud, and it's going to use the whole vCloud cluster, and that's what we're doing. And there's no networks built yet because we haven't, we haven't defined any external networks, so that's blank. That's okay. We don't need it right now. So next, I want to add storage to the environment, and there's the ability here. I kind of alluded to it before with storage profiles. We'll build some storage profiles in, in the future, but for right now, I'm just going to grab any storage and add it down here. So I just took my ISOs, my SSDs, and my SATA, and they're all available to this provider VDC. In the future, I'll show you how to make profiles so that we can kind of say maybe SSD. You can see I'm kind of alluding to it here. Tier 0 would be SSD. Tier 1 might be SATA, although typically Tier 1 is SAS and Tier 2 is SATA, but we only have two tiers. Um, prior to 5.1, you really couldn't do this. You, would, you could only give one type of storage to a provider VDC. So let's say uh, Flash. This, this whole provider VDC would have to be built just for Flash. Once I put one Flash data store in there, I could only put more Flash data stores in there because there was no way to define a storage profile. It was all treated as just one big pile of storage. So with 5.1, we can use storage profiles to further delineate, yeah, I've got a big pile of storage in here, but this is tier zero, it's, it's a different grade of storage than this tier one SATA is. So again, we'll go over that in a lot more detail in the future. Right now, we'll just grab all the storage and just pile it in there. And then kind of the final step in here is preparing the hosts. And that's where it's going to put the host in maintenance mode and apply some changes to it, uh, you know, install some software and, and, and prepare the host to be uh, used for vCloud Director. It actually installs an agent on the host and we need to give root credentials to the host in order to do that. Now, in my lab, all the hosts have the same password, so I can use this one credential for all hosts option. And by default, it's root is the account, and then let me put the password in here. And hopefully that's the right password. Uh, all, if, if that's not, you know, if you don't have just one password for all your hosts, you can use this different credentials for each host and type in the passwords for each. Because I've seen some uh, deployments where each host has its own unique password. It's really up to you how you've got it. Uh, in my labs, yeah, I just use the same one for everything. So let me click next there, and then we'll finish. And there we go. It's it's gone ahead and given you the green check mark because it's created the provider VDC. And before we finish here, I'll go ahead and switch over to manage and monitor, and we can kind of see the fruits of our labor here. In that 
Uh, first off, we have a cloud cell defined. That's the VCD at Glacier at local. That's the server we're directly connected to right now. We've got a provider VDC set up called Gold. It's our Gold resources, and it has little uh, images here. We got three data stores defined, one resource pool. That's the the root resource pool of the cluster vCloud. We're tied to the Chicago vCenter, and it's currently enabled. And checkmark means it's all good to go. Uh, we also have some vCenters defined here now. Let me expand this out so you can see it. So we got that Chicago vCenter maps to the vCenter dash cloud server. It's running 5.1. And we can also see that that vCenter server is tied to this IP for vShield Manager and to this proxy on the vCloud Director side. So you can see all the relationships that were built prior in these screens. And here's the hosts that are available to vCloud Director. We've got the two that are in this cluster, host six and seven, and we'll go over these different check marks because there's a lot. So it's basically saying the status of these hosts is green. Uh, there's no issues with the check mark. Uh, they are enabled which means that they are available for use right now. Uh, this is commonly, uh, disabling is commonly used if you want to prevent people from doing anything with the host from a resource perspective. So if I disabled the host, which I'll go ahead and do here, uh, no longer can vCloud place any workloads on that host. So if you need to do some maintenance on the host, you could disable it, which uh, prevents any kind of workloads from occurring on there, pull it out, you know, replace some hardware, whatever. Uh, ready means that it's been prepared, so it has the vCloud Director agent on it. And then this one, I'll go ahead and expand it out. It says available. It means that it's online and reachable. Uh, and then the vCloud Director network isolation is something we'll go over uh, in the future. I'm going to have to play a little, play a little uh, sliding game with these uh, uh, columns here. Uh, but that means that it's uh, ready for uh, or capable of being involved with vCloud Director network isolation. Uh, there's no VMs running on either one of these and they're part of the Chicago vCenter vCenter. So I'll go ahead and re-enable this guy and we'll move on. So moving down, we've got data stores and data store clusters. Now we're just using data stores in here and here's the three that are presented to the cluster. One I use for ISOs and the other we're gonna use in future lessons for uh, kind of a tier zero solid state drives and tier one SATA drives. Um, and you can see what type they are, how much of it is used on the disk, how much is provisioned on disk, and how much requested storage is coming from the vCloud Director environment. So you can already see that I'm using a good chunk of the storage on non-vCloud stuff. And that's probably going to be the way your lab is too, where you're going to have, uh, you don't really have the luxury of multiple storage arrays at home for the most part. I would, I would assume I don't. <laughs> so this is just letting me know that, you know, I've consumed a pretty good chunk of uh, that particular storage already on non-vCloud stuff. And that they're tied to one provider virtual data center at this time and the Chicago vCenter. Storage profiles is something we'll go into much deeper in the future. And just for now, we only have one called any, so there really isn't a storage profile. But if I click on that, you can see what involves any, so basically everything that belongs to that, which of those same three data stores. And you might be able to elude the fact that I've got a tier zero and a tier one data store. We're probably going to build some storage profiles in the future, so a little bit of a hint right there. Uh, but if we had different tiers uh, already laid out in storage profiles, so we could see how much was used versus provisioned and requested, and within each profile, how many data stores actually live inside of it. And then finally, we'll look at the switches and port groups. There's only one right now. I've actually built out a distributed switch that I call vCloud in here. Uh, it's currently enabled, and uh, there's no network ports really provisioned. It's kind of a, a naked switch right now. It's not doing anything. There's only one port group, something that I made prior called external access. Again, networking stuff will go into a lot deeper in the future lessons. And that concludes this lesson, so I look forward to seeing you in the next one.